Okay, so this is test review for chapter 17, 18, and 19. Okay, start out, we start with talking about Aristotle. We have to know about this. Basically, he thought all things were made as they are. Look at a bird, right? Well, it didn't evolve in that form. It's just that's the form it's always been in. It'll always be in that form until it's gone. Okay, that was what Aristotle thought and consequently taught. Uh, this view pretty much, you know, disregarded or did not take into account evolution. Now, this thought was, you know, taught in schools and, and you know, up until 1800. So, this thought permeated the scientific community at about the time of Darwin. Okay, so, you know, 1800s, 1900s, what's happening? Well, there's a lot of change happening in science. One change was the idea of um, evolution and changes in life. Okay. Uh, what caused this change was basically technology, right? Darwin could have had the technology to go to South America on the Beagle. Uh, Wallace had the technology to have samples brought to him from other places in the world. Things were more, technology allowed for things that Aristotle could not do. And that therefore changed the, his, their viewpoints and, you know, consequently science. So just know what comparative morphology is. Basically, it's comparing the shape, or we call morphology in science, of different species, and trying to, you know, put together some type of relationship between, you know, shapes. If a bird has a, a wing that's a foot long, and another bird has a wing that's two feet long and three feet long, you try to say, okay, well, the bird with one foot long wings might be here, the one with the longest wings, or is it the farthest away? That type of idea. So geology and biology, another technological, you know, thing that happened that Darwin, or that uh, Aristotle didn't have. Basically what happened was this. As you go down the geographic, or the geological time, you will actually see, you know, life forms evolving. You know, you go down a thousand feet and you'll see one type of life form. You go up a few hundred feet, you'll see a very similar life form. And when you, you know, gradually go up, you see there is a gradual change in life implying that there was a evolution. Okay. Now, how do these new theories... There was a couple different viewpoints about how change happens. Okay. Catastrophism thinks that change happens in spurts. Okay, so you're going along a long time without any change, and then all of a sudden there's a spike in change. And then it, that spike comes down, and you keep on going along, and a spike in change, and it comes down. Okay. That's what we call a punctuated model. There's little zones where it just pops up of change. Gradualism, a little bit different. The, the uh, evolution is by an accumulation of gradual changes. You know, changes a little bit here, then it slows down. Kind of like a wave type of idea. Okay. Uniformity, think of this as like it's a straight line. Change is always happening about the same rate over time. Okay, so Darwin, when we think Darwin, we think of the idea of natural selection. A couple uh, definitions of natural selection here, but basically what it means is survival of the fittest, if you want to think of it that way. Um, this is the process where an organism that's the best suited for its environment is able to survive, and because it can survive, it can reproduce. And that future generations will then consequently get those good characteristics. Okay. A lot of def different definitions, but that's pretty much it. A lot of people just say survival of the fittest. I like to say the survival and reproduction of the fittest. Because there's a reproduction in there because that passes the good alleles on to the next generation. Another thing with natural selection is it's environment specific. What, what, what might be good for uh, an allele in one environment might be have no effect or even be bad for that allele in another environment. Classical example of this is the allele for uh, malaria. In some environments that is beneficial. In other environments it's, uh, you know, it, it, it will not only hurt, it will, not, it, will, it will hurt your ability to reproduce. So it just depends on the actual uh, 
allele in the environment. Okay, so just here's Doran's observations. You know, just know those. Okay, natural selection, uh, we just talked about that. An adaptive trait is any trait that helps to increase the ability of an organism to reproduce. And again, adaptive traits are environment specific. Okay, so what might be a good adaptive trait for environment number one may or may not be a good adaptive trait for environment number two. It just depends on that particular environment. Okay, and you got a summary there. Okay, so you know, people think Darwin, right, was uh, the, the man who came up with all this stuff. Everyone thinks evolution and Darwin, you know, rightfully so. But, you know, there's other people that had some similar ideas. Um, when Darwin found all this stuff out, he, he didn't, like, f have his findings and, like, look what I found, let me go publish. No, he, he actually sat on his ideas for several years. A couple, you know, he had some religious misgivings about it, some uh, other things. So he didn't want to just, like, come out and talk about it. Another guy, Alfred Wallace, well, he had basically had the same idea that uh, um, Darwin had, you know, about evolution. And, uh, well, uh, Darwin was going to, I mean, um, Wallace was going to publish, and Darwin found out about it because they, you know, they sent each other manuscripts. And, uh, well, Darwin published first, and the rest is history. But we still remember the contributions of Wallace as well. Okay, a fossil. Fossil are just the remains of an animal. Now you can have different remains. One, well, let me say what is a fossil first. Okay, a fossil is when some type of body tissue has been replaced by minerals. Okay, that there was a bone and that... The minerals came in and, and mineralized that and then replaced parts of the bone. And over time, something that looks like that bone has developed. Okay. Two types of fossils. One type is a remnant, or a, a just a classical fossil type. This is a remnant of a body type. You know, a bone, a tooth, that type of thing. A trace fossil, though, is a little bit different. This is like a, a, a preserved footprint. A preserved egg. It's not the actual organism itself, it's just something that it interacted with in its environment. Now, how did both fossils form? I kind of hinted at that before that uh, bone is replaced by minerals over time, and that replacement forms what we would call a fossil. Now, fossils are not complete. A couple of reasons why. One is geological offense will destroy them. Uh, heavy wind, rain, stuff like that, it will destroy the record. Another issue here is soft tissue. Uh, fossils favor, I mean, excuse me, bones favor fossilization. Soft tissue like skin does not. So, you know, it's not going to get everything. But still, it's important enough that we uh, we use it. Okay, so how do we date these things, right? You've heard this before. You, and how do you date? It says that this is so many million years old by radiological testing. Well, this kind of explains how that happens. Um, essentially, what you're doing is you're looking for a ratio of isotopes. And we know how fast these isotopes decay. So what we do is we, we measure the amount of isotopes in a sample, and by some assumptions, we then can determine how old it is. Talked about this in class. For the test, just know what radiometric dating is, what a radioisotope is, and what half-life is. Okay, so we talked about, you know, uh, changes in the continents over, the, over time, right? Um, over a span of about half a billion years, 
this the landscape of the, of Earth has changed. You know, we have continental drift where land masses are moving around constantly. Classical example: South America, North America, or South America and Africa, where they two have separated. And we got to think about life, right? Life was on these land masses before they separated, and as they separated, life went and evolved on different pathways. We're going to talk about uh, allopatric speciation later on, but this is one of the mechanisms of that. So we talked about continental drift and plate tectonics. Essentially, we're just talking about how Earth has evolved itself and how the land masses have separated. Also, remember there's a biological part here that there was life on those land masses. And as we separate those land masses, life will evolve differently and form different species. And again, we talk about that with allopatric speciation later on. Okay, and then Gawanda, you know, the supercontinent, we hit about that. Uh, we talked about that. Okay, now we're talking about evolution, chapter 18. Um, key point here is populations evolve. Individuals do not. Evolution, you know, uh, thumbnail sketch of evolution is it's just a, a, a collection of changes over time. Okay, so populations over time will change. Individuals do not evolve. Populations do. Okay. How do these changes happen? It happens in the form of mutations. Mutations that happen in gametic tissue. And remember from last time, we said that if a change happens, it has to happen in gametic tissue for it to, to, for it to progress to future generations. Okay. Gene pool, you know, know the definition. And this just talks about how, um, where, you, where you can introduce uh, new genetic sequence. Okay. Mutations, you can have different mutations. Okay. Some mutations are lethal. Obviously, what does it imply? At, at birth, that that organism will have no chance of surviving. Uh, neutral mutations, they have no effect on survival, and then a beneficial mutation is it gives an advantage. Now, the whole thing with this is that it's environment-specific. What might be a beneficial mutation in one environment, when that same mutation happens in another, it could be neutral or, in fact, lethal even. Okay, so the, the, the mutations... The effect of mutation is dependent in many cases, but not all cases, on the environment it happens in. Okay, a little frequency, you know, the definition. Genetic equilibrium. This is an idea where populations do not change. If something is in genetic equilibrium, that population is not evolving. It's not changing. Now, we don't... No population can be in genetic equilibrium, okay, because for one, it has to have no mutation. But we know for a fact through G DNA replication, mutations do happen. Rarely, yes, but they do happen. So we, we look at this by understanding that this idea of genetic equilibrium, it simply cannot happen. But what we do is we, we put that as a standard, right? And how far something is from genetic equilibrium, the faster that population is changing. The closer it is to that genetic equilibrium, the slower it is changing. Okay. We talked about four processes that drive evolution. You should know those. And also, you, this is important. You should know the five conditions of genetic equilibrium. Okay. And again, genetic equilibrium, this is not something that happens. It's more of one of those things where it, if there was no change, this would happen. But we do know there is changes over time. So all populations are evolving, some very slowly, some very rapidly. But all are evolving on a very, on some level. Okay, so five conditions for a stable gene pool. Mutations do not occur. Population is infinitely large. For the mutations, 
we know that DNA replication will introduce, popu uh, introduce uh, mutations. So we know that first point does not happen or cannot happen entirely. Population is infinitely large. No, population is, totally, is, is infinitely large, so that doesn't happen either. No gene flow, random mating, and all individuals survive and reproduce equally. So we'll talk about all those in a few minutes. Okay, so populations evolve. Again, we talked about that before. The Hardy-Weinberg equation. This is an equation that we use to look at how fast the population is changing. We look at it based on the change in alleles. If an allele is changing its proportion over time, then that implies change in evolution. If an allele is not changing its frequency over time, then that implies no change or closer to genetic equilibrium. So that's what the Hardy-Weinberg is used. Hardy-Weinberg formula is used for. It allows us to look at allele frequencies and determine something about genetic equilibrium. So, for example, you got three populations here, and look at what's happening with the early population or starting population, middle generation, and the last generation there's no change over consecutive generations and that right there is genetic equilibrium okay know the Hardy-Weinberg you, you don't need to know the Hardy-Weinberg equation by heart but if I was to put something with like alleles in you should be able to recognize what an allele is relative to the equation Okay, so we've got three models of natural selection. Natural selection is what? Survival of the fittest. Talked about that before. Okay. Three models, directional, stabilizing, and disruptive. So directional is when one feature, one part of the population is favored, or one part of the population is disfavored. Classical example of this is bacteria and antibiotic resistance. Um, you got a bacteria. We got you know you got billions of bacteria, right? But just by random chance, some of those are going to get a uh, mutation that will give them the ability to not be affected by an antibiotic. When you treat a patient with antibiotics, that one that has that very rare change, it will live. All the other bacteria. Well, they die. There's a competitive advantage to having that trait, you know, that mutation, and that bacteria lives, proliferates, and spreads. The bacteria that do not have that change, well, they all die. Okay, so that's the idea of directional selection, that one, one feature is being selected for, and another feature is being selected against. They use this uh, showing with butterflies, but you see the, le the left is being selected against, hence the red arrow is pointing down. The right is being selected far, with the green arrow is pointing up. And over time, we see that there is selection. Okay, so directional selection, uh, just know the picture, know what to do about it, okay, about resistance. Okay, the other two types are stabilizing and disruptive selection. So stabilizing selection is when the average phenotype is selected far over time, or the or you can say that the, the mean is selected for, the extremes are selected against. So here is the mean, and over time the mean is selected for, and the extremes are selected against. Disruptive selection is kind of the opposite. The mean is selected against, and the extremes are selected for. So know the definition of all three.
Okay, so balanced polymorphism is where two or more alleles are relatively high frequencies in an environment because of natural selection. Good example of this is sickle cell anemia, that there are mul there's two versions, well at least there's more than two actually, but there is um, more than one allele for hemoglobin. And one of those hemoglobin alleles, H HBS, causes sickle cell anemia. And there's multiple copies of this. There's a large number of these still in the population, particularly in Africa where, malaria, where um, sickle cell anemia gives a protection against malaria. But this is an example. So just know what a balanced polymorphism is. You know, genetic drift is random change in allele frequencies over time. So, for example, um, blood type, right? That's an allele frequency. Over time, you know, that blood type the number, the number of alleles for the type A, type B, and type O blood, those are going to change over time. That's genetic drift. Now fixation, what happens though is genetic drift can lead to the loss of alleles or genetic diversity in small populations. Okay, so some alleles will just, you know, there's so few of them over time that given enough time in a small population, they go away. Now, fixation is when all individuals in a population are homozygous for one allele. You could think that genetic drift taken to an extreme leads to fixation. Okay. So just the point that we made that genetic drift happens more in small populations. Okay. Genetic drift happens more in small populations and less in large populations. Okay, genetic bottleneck is a severe reduction in population size. Um, for example, see the picture? We have a lot of blue dots and white balls and blue balls and yellow balls, right? Well, in a bottleneck event, a large number of the population is killed off, only leaving a few left over. And that few left over reproduce. But that few left over do not have the full complement of alleles that were originally present in that original population. Because they don't have the full complement of alleles, many alleles will be lost in that extinction event. Okay. So just know what a bottleneck is. Founder effect, kind of the same idea as a, a bottleneck. What happens is when a bottleneck happens and you, you have a very small population that can start a larger population, you're going to lose alleles in the process. Gene flow is the movement of alleles geographically. Okay, Classical example is the migration of Homo sapien, started in Africa, moved up through Africa, through uh, Europe, and the Middle East, what we call the Middle East now, through India, Asia, so on and so forth. But the point is this, alleles have, will move, okay, animals move, and as animals move, the alleles they contain move with them. So that's gene flow. Now this is a two-way street. You can have a flow outside or inside. So you can lose alleles with gene flow or you can gain it. Just depends on which end of the flow you're on. Speciation, you should know this, it's the process that a new species forms. Speciation is an evolutionary process by which a new species forms. A couple ways we can do this is um, reproductive isolation. We'll, we'll come back to this in a minute. We'll come back to this in a minute. Actually, look, we'll talk about it now. Um, reproductive isolation is when the, there's no more genetic exchange between populations. Okay. So know what prezygotic and postzygotic isolation mechanisms are <coughs> for reproductive isolation. Prezygotic is when there's something that will prevent a zygote from forming, will prevent fertilization. Postzygotic is something that will weaken or make the hybrids produced less fit. Okay, so speciation, allopatric speciation is how you know new species arise, how we get new species 
developing through evolution. When we talked about how the uh, continent separated, that w new species formed because of allopatric speciation. Okay. Um, so essentially what happens is when you take a population and physically separate them, be it a mountain range or splitting continents apart, and you have two separate populations that evolve at different rates and under different pressures, over time we've got two different species. Now sometimes we can do this without putting a physical barrier between the two. One type is called sympatric speciation, the other is parapatric speciation. Sympatric is when a change happens to a very small number and this change does not let them reproduce with the others in that population. Okay, so for example, if there's a change in chromosome number in plants, that polypoidy, uh, polypoidy part, that would make some of those plants not be able to reproduce with the other plants in its population. Thereby, what happens is that forms its own population. Another example is parapatric speciation. If there's a common border, for example, and there are two separate species, a third species can form in the middle from a mix of the two. Kind of reviews what this like, type of speciation we were talking about. We have allopatric, sympatric, and parapatric. Okay, stasis is what happens when there's little to no change in a genetic base. Uh, best example of this is the coelacanth, uh, a fish that we thought it was extinct for millions of years. Turned out that it wasn't and had changed very little in the time between when it was, first, when it was caught about 100 years ago and when its fossil records from 100 million years ago were looked at. So there is sometimes evolution does not happen very fast and that idea is stasis. Okay, and you know uh, pre-adaption, you should know that. Adaptive radiation, when there's a large number of species form at one time, that's adaptive radiation. A great example of this is the KT divide or the KT line. Now key innovation is something that allows an organism or a population to survive in a new habitat. For example, when there was that mass extinction event that killed off the dinosaurs, before that, mammals were very small, not very plentiful. Because of that, what happens is what? We, as mammals, have a key innovation. We can, you know, survive in that colder environment. We evolved. We didn't take over, but we significantly advanced in our use of the environment. We had adaptive radiation. Many more species were born. We went from uh, mammals being, you know, very small dog cat sized mammals to, you know, being giraffe and elephant size and a wide range, including us. That right there is adaptive radiation. Okay, you should know what extinction is. And, you know, we said this in class, Extinction is not irrevocable. This is irrevocable loss of species. Irrevocable now. But, you know, in the future, DNA technology, we might be able to clone some species in the future. Not saying we will or won't. It's just something that we might do. Okay. Chapter 19. Taxonomy is the science of classifying and naming species. How we group different species together based on their names and relationships. You should know this list in order from general, which is domain, all the way to species, which is the most specific. You might think of, King Philip came over for good spaghetti. Mm-mm, good. If you want to think of it that way. Lame, but you know, it is what it is. What this does is it helps to organize all life in a hierarchical pattern. Okay, Think of these as folders and folders and folders. we got one big folder, the domain. And that domain folder, we've got several kingdom folders, right? We've got one for plants, one for animals. Okay, And each of those, we've got a phylum folder. And then in one phylum folder, we got lots of class folders. So it's just like folders in your computer. You got one big 
folder for your operating system and you open that up and there's lots of folders in that. And each folder you open up and there's even more folders in that. Okay, so that's the idea here. We can drill down to any organism to give it a genus and species name. Also know who is the man who did this, Carl Linnaeus. He even Latinized his name because he liked it so much. Um, all organisms are named by their genus and species name. Genus is first, species is second. You know, Homo sapien. Genus is Homo sapien is a species. Homo erectus. Homo is the genus. Erectus is the species. Now, cladistics determines an evolutionary relationship on different species based on features or some genetic uh, feature. Clades are a group of species that follow, ha have similar characteristics. You know, for example, let's look at this picture right here. Do you see where that, it says amphibians and then um, emulates? That is a clade. Okay, the one that says ray fin fish and lobe fin fish and lung fish, that is a clade. Okay, it's a grouping of similar organisms. Okay. We, in evolution, what we, what we do in biology is to describe these relationships, we make these evolutionary trees, or these life trees, or phylogenetic diagrams, or cladograms. Lots of names these things go by, but basically it's an image that helps us to relate multiple species relationship. What you need to know about this is the closer two are, the more closely related they are. The more separated two are, the more distant they are. Now you see how there's a line, horizontal lines and vertical lines, and where those vertical and horizontal lines meet, in some places there's like a three-point intersection. We talked about this in class. Each of those three-point intersections is made up of two vertical lines and one horizontal. We call that a node. The more nodes that separate two animals or two, two um, organisms, the more distantly related they are. So more nodes, more distantly related. Fewer nodes, more closely related. So morphological divergence is when a body part from a common ancestor evolves differently. Okay, for example, um, tails, right? All those came from one animal, but over time the tails of a monkey evolved differently than the tails on a chimpanzee, and the, the tail of a human, we lost it actually, um, tail of a cat, tail of a dog. If you were to trace back all these animals, there would be one progenitor animal with a tail. Well, through morphological divergence, that tail, right, has taken on different shapes, different functions, different forms in the animals. That's morphological divergence. Morphological convergence is the opposite. Or not the opposite, it's uh, uh, some ideas are just so good that they're going to happen multiple times and they're not related. Does that make any sense? The idea of having a wing, right? The idea of having some type of tissue structure that takes advantage of the air and allows an organism to fly high is a great idea. We see it in insects. We see it in mammals, for example, bats. We also see it in birds. But did these all come from the same, you know, organism with wings? Probably not. No, it did not. It, they evolved different at different times but they evolve the same basic feature that's morphological convergence similar body parts similar structure but not a common ancestor and then with that goes analogous structures analogous structures are wings for example Okay, we talked about, what else we talked about? Comparing DNA. Many times we compare DNA in order to determine a phylogenetic relationship, to determine how close organisms are to one another. 
And to do that, we do like things called DNA alignments, where we take DNA sequence, compare them. The more different sequences, the more distantly separated they are. The closer sequences, the more closely related they are. And that pretty much wraps it up for the test. Uh, good luck.